Good morning. Welcome to the Franklin Baptist Church. It is so good to see you here today on this uh, beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. And uh, a little warm out there, but I praise the Lord for air conditioning. Amen. And I'm so thankful we can sit in here nice and cool. That doesn't mean you can go to sleep if you get too comfortable. Uh, you got to stay awake, but I'm glad that you're good to have visitors with us today. God bless you for choosing to come and worship with us. And it's always a blessing to have visitors here in our services. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to bless our service before we begin our, our singing. And let's just ask right now, and, and I'd encourage you, pray right now that God would just speak to you. And, uh, and let's just make a decision. We're gonna open up our ears and our minds and our hearts for what God has for us. And, uh, and let's listen for what God has for us today with heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here together today. Dear Lord, thank you for this chance to worship and praise and exalt you. And I pray that you would be exalted and praised today. And I pray to Heavenly Father, you just do a work in each heart and life that's here. You just speak to us, dear Lord, and challenge us. Dear Lord, convict us of what needs to change, dear Lord. Show us the next step that we need to take. But I just pray most of all, dear Lord, you just help us to see a clearer image of your son, Jesus. That we just might lift him up and exalt him and praise him, dear Lord, in the decisions that we make and the lives that we live. I pray today if there's one here that's never asked Jesus to come to their heart and save them, I pray today be that day of salvation. But I pray today, dear Lord, you'd be lifted up and exalted and your will be done. Bless me with our children's church classes, dear Lord, and be with those little ones. Help them, dear Lord, to learn and to grow and to draw nearer to you. But dear Lord, I just pray right now that you'd be lifted up and exalted and your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dave's going to come and lead us and let's sing together as Dave leads us in our first song. <clears throat> amen. Well, good morning. Let's stand together here this morning as we turn to our hymn books, hymn number 56 to start things off. As we sing together, To God Be the Glory, 56.
for Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died to set us free. And uh, we have so much to be thankful for as believers. And and, and honestly, we have uh, we, we worry so much. I, it's part of our second nature to gripe and complain and to worry and to fear. But I'll tell you what, as Christians, we are so blessed. I want to remind you today of that amazing grace and what that means for us as Christians. In 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Folks, there is victory in this world through our faith in Jesus Christ. And I know I, I, I know many of y'all are struggling and hurting. I know that many of y'all are facing various health issues. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, I know today... Uh, we've got more more people with walkers here today than usual, and, and a few extra walkers in the congregation. I, I know some are getting older and some are struggling. Uh, I know some of us were facing spiritual battles and temptations. Uh, I, I know there's some that are that are facing financial struggles and problems. But can I tell you something? We have the promise of God. There is victory over the things of this world. There's something greater than the problems and pain. There's something greater than the worries and fears of this world. And that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. I hope today that you have faith that Jesus Christ has the ability to save you from your sins and to give you an eternal home in heaven. And I hope today that you have faith that Jesus Christ is able to give you victory in things of this life. And I'm not saying you're always going to be wealthy, you're always going to be healthy, but I'll tell you this. I believe that Jesus Christ can give us the peace and allow us to be triumphant in the pain. Jesus Christ can give us power to have, have, have victory in, in this world over the problems. And, and God solves problems, not necessarily the ways we expect, but God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So I hope your faith is in Him, and, uh, and I hope you're celebrating that. Our next song is going to talk about the victories that we have through Jesus Christ as well. And so as we continue to sing, let me encourage you, worship the Lord. Thank God for what He's done and what He's going to do in your life. And make sure that your faith is in Jesus Christ uh, to provide for your needs and to solve your problems today. Dave's going to come and lead us. Let's sing that. Amen. Let's stand again. As Pastor said, this next song talks about those victories and it's titled this we know and it's about that blessed assurance what we can be assured of and that we know the victory is coming so as keegan plays let's sing that song together this morning this we know
there are classes and you're free to greet one another here this morning.
for the Browns. They're missionaries in Hawaii, and uh, they've uh, suffered a great loss through these fires that are taking place. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but I'd encourage you now, be faithful with your tithes and your faith promised missions giving. If you do have a love offering for the Browns, please make sure that goes in an envelope and it's clearly marked uh, for the Browns or for Hawaii. But, uh, but otherwise, be faithful to give. Worship the Lord with us as uh, we give back to Him with heads bowed and with eyes closed. Brother Tom Bennett, would you lead us as we pray, please, sir? Father, this time, Lord, just to give us the wisdom here, Lord, to use this offering for the brothers of your Lord in your kingdom. Lord, may go to where it is and you know. And Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this day. Lord, just be with you. May we see you today. And Lord, we just ask us to protect us from the very nature of the Lord. May we move them today. We thank you for everything that I'm going to ask you. Jesus, it's your name. Amen. Amen. spoken this morning about trials and tribulations and victories and as pastor mentioned each of us is going through a variety of things whether it's spiritual battles or financial battles or relationship struggles or health and physical struggles but as we run this this race this christian life we're called in the scriptures to keep our eyes on jesus not to look to the left and to the right at the circumstances that distract us in this world and I'm reminded of Peter when he stepped out of the boat and he walked on water when he kept his eyes on Jesus. But when he took in the circumstances that are around him, when he looked to the left and the right and saw the storm and his faith faltered and he put, he, he took more weight to those things and less of his focus on Jesus and he began to sink. And I think it's important this morning, no matter the circumstances, no matter the battles you're facing, that we keep our eyes on Jesus and we keep our eyes and our faith in that victory. So this morning I want to sing from one of the old hymns. I love the, I love the new modern songs. They're great. But I hope we never lose the old hymns. And I hope we always revert back to them. And this morning I'll sing from 147 in our hymn books as we sing, How Great Thou Art. Let us always remember, despite the circumstances, how great He is in our life. Oh Lord my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died, to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great 
thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Sing with me that chorus one more time. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great. Brother Dave, boy, what a, what a great song and, and uh, really a great intro to the message as well. I can remember, I can remember not too long ago that sports used to unite us when there were Olympic Games or when there was World Championships. There would there would be a uniting of Americans together to cheer on our team and. And uh, something happened. I've never really been a soccer fan, but uh, but you almost couldn't help but pay attention to the women's soccer the past few years. Uh, if you watch the news at all, they've been in the news quite a bit. But I saw a headline this week, and I have not. I don't follow the World Cup. I I really don't know. Um, I just don't follow soccer. Uh, but uh, but I did see a uh, news article. The headline. The first news article. The first headline I saw concerning U.S. women's soccer this past week was that they had lost, and uh, my theme might have been the first round, but they lost out, they're, they're, they're out of the, the World Cup, and, and the article, the headline said, many Americans are happy that they were out. And, uh, and I, I'm, I don't want to make this a political message or a political statement, but, but like I said, you don't have to follow soccer to see women's soccer in the news quite a bit. And over the past couple years, there's been a lot of discussion about how much money they make and about the pay that they make. There's been a lot of uh, things said about them as far as their political um, uh, leanings and ideology, the political uh, correctness. There's been uh, there's been the blue hair and everything else. There's and, and there's the, the kneeling. This is the thing, honestly. And like I, said, I try not to get political when I preach, but it really bothers me that when somebody representing the United States of America kneels during our national anthem and and so over the past couple of years we've seen all these things coming from u.s women's soccer and uh, to the point that now when when they lose americans rather than being sad rather than us being united to support our team americans are happy that they lost sports used to unite us and of course sports used to be about sports Representing your country used to be about representing your country. Not hating your country. I, I find it interesting that as the focus has gotten away from where the focus used to be, and just talking about the world stage, it might be women's soccer, it might be national competitions in track and field or the Olympics. When we take 
the focus off of the sports and off of the nation that's represented. I'll tell you what, there's divisions and there's problems. And then you find issues like this coming up where people in America are happy that America lost because we're so divided. The truth of the matter is, as Christians today, our life is a race. And it's so important that we keep the main thing the main thing. Because it's easy for us today, and let me tell you something, Christians, <laughs> Franklin Baptist Church, it is so easy for us to get angry and to make politics the main thing. And politics is not the main thing, Christian. And I know we gripe about the politics and the divisiveness in this nation, but I know we get so wrapped up in it, we get so caught up in it, we get so angry with it. Politics is not the main thing. It's not the most important thing. And sports is not the most important thing. And, and, and it might be a nice diversity. And, and listen, I, I think Christians should be politically active. I think they should. I think sports is a nice diversion. I think there's a lot of things in this world that are good and we ought to be involved and we ought to be invested in, but it's not the main thing. Your life is a race. And you are running the race of your life even now today. And it's so easy to get distracted by things that are not the most important thing, and that's when we fail. And I'm not saying the women's soccer team lost because they're focused on political things or focused on money, but I'll tell you what, the support and the opportunity to unite us as a nation when we need it, that disappeared because the focus was lost. They may not have lost the soccer match because their focus was wrong, but I guarantee you they lost an opportunity to help us as a nation because their focus was wrong. And I'll tell you what, we'll miss a lot of opportunities in the race of our life if our focus is wrong. We've been looking here in Hebrews 12, and I'd encourage you, open up your Bible, turn there, and look there with me today in Hebrews chapter number 12. We'll be looking at primarily the first three verses today. We'll add an extra verse in today. We'll be looking at the first three verses. But today I want us to think about the race that we're running. That's how the Bible describes our lives. It's a race. It has a beginning, and folks, it has an end. And we need to run that race the right way. As we've looked at this, we've seen how we need to run along the right path. God has planned the path for us. He's provided a pattern for us to run. He's going to be present there with us, but God has laid out the path that we need to run. And that means that we need to get saved. We need to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. We need to get scripturally baptized, and then we need to unite with the church and, and serve God through the church. There's a plan. God has laid out. There's a path that He has for us. And, and the race must be run at the right preparation. We looked at this last week. <coughs> And again, we'll see this in our text in just a moment. But we need to exclude the unnecessary baggage. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And we need to run with patience. With patience. Today I want to come back to that thought of the right focus. That's the right priority. We ought to run the race with the right priority in mind. And it's not politics, and it's not sports, and it's not the almighty dollar. It's not our careers, and it's not our family. Our focus needs to be on Jesus Christ. Look with me here in Hebrews chapter number 12. Look at the first three verses today. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Here we have an opportunity to prevent this weariness and this fainting. 
by looking unto Jesus, by considering Christ. And in the life that we run, the life that we live, the race that we run today, each and every one of us needs to see where Christ falls in our priority list. Each and every one of us today needs to refocus on Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one to look to. Would you join me here as we pray, as we ask God to bless the preaching of His Word, with heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You so much for Jesus Christ, who took on human form, dear Heavenly Father, who chose to live here on this earth. And thank You for that sinless and perfect life, dear Heavenly Father. Thank You for the fact that He went to Calvary's cross for our sins. Thank You, dear Lord, for that gift of salvation. And I thank You, dear Heavenly Father, for the privilege that we have of knowing Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, of being able to speak to you because Jesus Christ is our mediator. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the example that he's laid for us. Help us today, dear Heavenly Father, to identify Jesus Christ, turn our focus to him, and identify him as the author and finisher of our faith and the example that you've given us today. And I just pray today, if there's one here that's lost that doesn't know Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior, they begin that relationship with Christ today. For those of us, dear Lord, that are looking for your will, dear Lord, be in tune with what Jesus Christ has for us today. I pray, dear Lord, for that one today that's hurting, they turn to Jesus Christ, dear Heavenly Father, for comfort and strength and help. But today, dear Lord, I just pray that your will be done. I pray today Jesus Christ will be lifted up and glorified in each and every heart and life that's here. And I pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Look unto me, and be saved. Jesus Christ is the priority. Our Heavenly Father is the one to look to. He's the one we need to turn our attention to today. And, uh, and let's make sure that we're doing that. And we'll see how we can do that in a few ways here today that maybe will help us to keep from fainting, to help us, uh, to prevent us from, uh, from, from, from growing weary uh, here today. And so let's look to Jesus Christ today. We find, first of all, that He is the author. He is is the author of our faith. And, and look again at what the Bible says there in verse number 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the origin. That word author, it, it, it means captain or prince or chief leader. It is his plan. It is his leadership. It is, it is Christ that has laid out for us our faith. And, and from the beginning right down to where we are today, our faith is laid out by Jesus Christ. It is our faith in Jesus Christ that is of the utmost importance. In John chapter number 1, the Gospel of John introduces us to Jesus Christ in the first several verses in a very unique and a special way. He introduces this is Jesus Christ here to us as the Word. And, and, and we're only just going to look at the first four verses. We can read through uh, most of that first chapter and look at this beautiful description of Jesus Christ as the Word. Let me share with you a few of those verses there. In, first, in John chapter number 1, and in verse number 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Here in this introduction to Jesus Christ, here in the Gospel of John, here we find that He is the Word, and we find that He is the beginning. He is the author. He's the captain, the prince, and the chief leader. Three things specifically that I want us to take note of is Jesus Christ. As we draw our attention to Christ, He is the author of creation. He was there from the very beginning. He was present and he was involved. The Bible says here, and it's not, it wasn't on the screen, but, but, but in John chapter 1, verse number 3, the Bible says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ, the author of our creation, he was there at the beginning with God because he was God. That's what the Bible tells us. He was with God. He was God. And he was there at the beginning of the creation because everything that was made was made by him. Nothing was made that was not made by Him. He, has, he was an integral part of who we are in the world that we live in, in this universe around us, in how life functions. Christ was present, I want you to think about this, and involved not just in the origins of creation, but in the maintaining of creation. <laughs> The fact that this earth still spins on its axis and revolves around the sun, the fact that there is oxygen to breathe, the fact that we, that we on, this, on this beautiful planet have the ability to, uh, to, to interact with, with, with various... I'll tell you, it's, it's 
the, the, the water and the, and, and the plants and the animals and the, and the atmosphere itself, all that work together to give us life and to give us a tremendous life. All because Jesus Christ is the author of our creation. And please believe me, this world was created. It didn't happen by accident. It's not random chance. And you're not a product of random chance. And you're not a product of, of, of just happenstance. And, 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 and your life has more meaning and more purpose because Jesus Christ is the author of our creation. And He formed us with purpose. And He formed us with a plan. He formed us to have a relationship with Him. But because, of course, we are fallen, that means that relationship is fractured. But that doesn't change our path or God's plan for us. He still wants that, that relationship with us. Jesus Christ, the author of creation, is also the author of the Bible. We know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is given to us by inspiration of God. Jesus Christ is an integral part of giving us His Word. And that means today when we open up this book, this is a living book. And by that, it, 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 it speaks to us. God speaks to us through these words. Jesus Christ is present and alive. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And He is the Word today. And so when we open up this book, we hear from Christ. We're engaged with Christ in a relationship with Him as we listen to what He has for us today. And what a shame it is. I know sometimes, I know sometimes we pick it up and, and we just see the words and we don't see Christ. And unfortunately, sometimes we get distracted by the things of this life. We get numbed by, by the things of this world. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we, we open up the book and we're not looking for Christ. But He's there and He wants to speak to us. This is a living book. He's the author of the Bible. He's the Word. And let's not forget He's the author of salvation. I mentioned before That because we're fallen, God designed us with a plan. Jesus Christ shaped and molded us to have a relationship with Him. That because of the sin in our lives, all of sin, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God, there is now separation between us and God because of our sin. And so Jesus Christ is the means and method of our salvation. Of us being able to reunite with God the Father and have a relationship with Him. The Bible says there again in 1 John 1, I'm sorry, in the Gospel of John 1, verse number 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus Christ is the means by which we can have life, and there's light from Him that, that enlighten us to the knowledge of God and the relationship with God through Christ and through Christ alone. He is the author of our salvation because He is the one, and I don't want to get ahead of myself too far, but He is the one that went to Calvary's cross and paid the penalty for our sin. He is the one that rose again from from the grave on that third day to give us victory over death because death is that final enemy there and he's defeated death. Jesus Christ is the one that's going to call us home one day. Amen. And I'm preaching ahead of myself. You're going to hear all this again in just a minute. Amen. But he's the author of our salvation. He's the one to look to because you cannot save yourself and neither can I. And you are not good enough to get to heaven on your own and neither am I. And there's nobody in this room or on this earth in human form today that can save your soul and fix what's broken inside of you. Jesus Christ came to this earth so that He can provide the means by which we can get to heaven. And that is when we humble ourselves and pray and ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior, acknowledging our sin and trusting in Him to save us from our sins. That is the only hope that we have. But I'll tell you what, it's a very secure hope. That's the anchor that we hold on to. He is the author, the captain, the prince, the chief leader. He's the author of our faith. Let's yield to His orders. All authority is His in creation, in this book, and, and in salvation. Let's make sure we're doing it Christ's way. Christ is the author of our faith, but He's also the finisher of our faith. 
He's the finisher of our faith. He completes our faith. He planned out, think about this, He planned out the creation and was, and was involved in, 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 in informing the things of this world. Jesus Christ is the author of the Scripture that He has given to us. He is the author of our salvation. He's the means by which we can be saved. And I want you to see what exactly He does as He, primarily, as He saves us today. Salvation is, 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 is such a, a simple thing, and it is such a complex thing. Salvation is, is, is such an expensive, extravagant, uh, costly measure, but yet it is, it is so freely offered uh, to us today. Uh, salvation can seem like, and, and people will talk about a simple salvation, and it can be very simple, but we need to understand also the complexity. It's free to us, but we need to understand the cost. And it is Jesus Christ, the finisher, the completer of our faith. And so understand today what it is that Jesus does for us. As we're running our race, as we look to Christ, we find, and, and we know and some of these things y'all have heard before, I'm sure, but he saves us from that penalty of sin. At the moment of salvation, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we find at that moment that, that our sins are forgiven. The Bible says in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. Imagine what that handwriting of ordinances against us would entail. I... I don't like thinking about it. I'm certainly not going to tell you what that would mean for me. I'd be too ashamed. But every wicked deed that we've ever done, every hateful or mean-spirited or, or, or terrible thing we've ever said, those, those lustful or covetous or bitter thoughts that we have thought, written out in that handwriting of ordinances. Can you imagine today knowing that there was a handwriting of ordinances? There was a book that listed all of your sins, all of your transgressions against God? I'll tell you what, the best of us, the purest and the cleanest and the nicest and, and the most gentle of people, that handwriting of ordinances would be, would be shocking to the rest of us. I'm so thankful that when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, as He was nailed there, as His blood flowed, that handwriting of ordinances, all my guilty charges that were laid against me were nailed to that cross with Jesus Christ. And now on that handwriting of ordinances are listed because I have received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. All every wicked thought is crossed out and Jesus' name is placed there. Every wicked deed that I've done is crossed out and Jesus' name is placed there. Every, every horrendous, uh, mean-spirited, uh, wicked thing that I've said is crossed out and Jesus' name is written there. Because that handwriting of ordinances that was written against us was nailed to His cross. He paid the price. He paid the penalty. And when we receive Jesus Christ, that is washed away immediately. He takes the blame. He takes the punishment for us. That guilt and that shame, it's extra baggage. We don't have to carry it around anymore. Let's lay aside that weight in the sin which does so easily beset us. He saves from the penalty of sin, that moment of salvation. And folks, He's not done there. I'm so thankful. He continues to work to save us from the power of sin. It's an ongoing process. That's why the Bible tells us here as we run this race to lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us because even as Christians, as we're running this, this race, we still have to battle temptation. We have to battle the flesh. We have to battle the world and the devil. And there's an ongoing fight uh, that, that we have to encounter and, and, and engage in each and every day with the flesh and the world and the devil because we are still prone to sin. And it is amazing to me <laughs> the avenues and the ways by which temptation can come. 
It's amazing to me the new sins that we can find to sin. Well, I could tell you about just over the years, the progression and my knowledge. I'll be honest, I don't mean to brag, but I've become quite an expert on sinning. I really have. I, I, over the years, I've seen the, the, the change and the progression of things that I maybe I used to battle when I was younger are not such a battle anymore. But I'll tell you what, I've managed to find new ways to sin. I've managed to find new, new temptations slither in. And, and it's easy for us to blame technology. And, and technology and, you know, can be an avenue for sin. And it might be social media, it might be the internet. You know, it, it certainly, that's a huge problem. I'll say internet pornography is such a huge, huge problem affecting our young people, not just the boys, the girls as well. And it's, it's impacting in such a negative way. But that's just the avenue by which it gets in. Uh, because I'll tell you something, we are prone to it, we're drawn to it, the lust of the flesh. And, and if that's not the sin that you're prone to, I'll tell you something, there is, there is that covetousness, there is that greed, that is that desire for possessions or things or dollars, and, and, and it lures us away, and we need to have all the best name brands and all the newest gadgets, and, and it can lure us away. We just talked about our deacons uh, on, on, on Wednesday night, not specifically about our deacons here in this church, uh, but uh, we're, 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 we nominated officers, we talked about the office of deacon, and one of the requirements is that they're not supposed to be uh, greedy and, and, and seeking after filthy loot. That's what the Bible says. They're not supposed to be pursuing things. And it is a trap. It's always been a trap. It's not just the trap of the rich. It's the trap of the poor to, to covet and desire things in this life. And it's so easy for us to take good things and twist them into bad. To make our children an idol that pulls us away from God and away from church. To, to, to money to take it uh, lift it up as an idol to take us away from God and away from church our service oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stray really close to something personal so I'm going to try to be careful here it's easy for us to look at our service and to say boy look look at how good I am or to, to look at our service and and, and, and I don't know, we just get, we, we, just, we just exalt ourselves. Or sometimes, you know, here's, here's another one I think a lot of us struggle with. It's, you know, uh, we feel sorry for ourselves. I do so much and nobody appreciates me. And pretty soon it can turn into selfishness. It can turn into self-pity. It can turn into bitterness towards others. To, uh, th there's a lot of ways to sin. And, and how, boy, how those, that, that sin ensnares us and traps us and sneaks up on us. The devil's always finding a new way because the flesh is susceptible. But folks, you're not alone in the fight. I'm not alone in the fight. And I say I may be an expert on sin, but so are you. But we don't have to stand alone. We don't have to fight alone. Jesus Christ is there to give us victory, to overcome temptation, to, to, to overcome uh, the, 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 the devil in this world. He's given us armor to put on, that helmet of salvation. We focused on this at, at, during uh, Vacation Bible School this year. That helmet of salvation, that breastplate of truth, and gird about with truth, and, and, and the breastplate of righteousness, I'm sorry, gird about with truth, and, and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, carrying that shield of faith where which we can quench all the fiery darts of the, wit, the wicked and, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have this armor. We can be victorious in the fights that we have to fight. We can be victorious over the enemy. He's given us armor to equip ourselves with. He's given us His presence in our lives to give us strength. I read for you 1 John 5, 5 earlier, but, but I'll, I'll read it for you again. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Our faith is victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world is the song that we sing. And that's the scriptural truth that we find in God's Word. He saves from the power of sin. You know what? I know we have the flesh and the devil and, and the world trying to tempt us, but the truth of the matter is, Christian, we don't have an excuse to sin. We have everything we need to be victorious through Jesus Christ if our focus is right. If He's our priority. 
And folks, one day He's going to save from the presence of sin. Now this is yet to come. I look forward to that day though. When Jesus Christ comes back, and that's His promise to us. In John 14, when Jesus tells the disciples He's going to send up into heaven, He tells them there, He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And Jesus said this, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus promised He's going to come back one day. If our faith and trust is in Jesus Christ, He's going to come back one day and, and, and receive us unto Himself. And this is going to be done personally. We know 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, the Bible says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That day is coming when the trumpet sounds and the Lord Himself descends from heaven with that shout. The dead in Christ rise first. And those of us that are alive and remain will be caught up together with Him. I look forward to that day when Jesus personally, as He promised to, He personally comes back for us. Amen. What a day that'll be. And I'm so thankful. We get a new body. I'm so thankful that the aches and pains and problems, I, I, know, I know some of y'all are battling physical ailments right now. Just think of that day when we get a glorified body. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sowed in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. At that resurrection, this, this, this flawed body, this broken body, possibly that this dead body will be raised again and changed and glorified at the resurrection at the last day. And folks, Jesus Christ is coming back. He has promised to come back. He is personally going to come back. He's going to provide a new body for us when He comes back. No more glasses. Shed some of those extra pounds. Some of y'all might regrow some missing hair. I don't know. I don't know what that body will be like. I know the Bible says in 1 John 3, 2, a little hint of that. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that he's the... We do know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We'll be like Jesus. We'll be like Jesus. We'll have that same form that He has. And folks, this is not just a promise, the finisher of our faith. It's not just a promise of freedom from temptation, but all consequences of sin and all the problems we experience daily. That What a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see. He's the finisher of our faith. Don't get your eyes off of Christ. What He started, He's going to finish. And right now as we run the race, He is the example of our faith. That's the command we have here. Look again in Hebrews 12, verse number 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here we have a little glimpse, it just in this verse, just a small glimpse of the race that Jesus Christ ran and the example that He has set for us. Just a little glimpse of His race. We can read through the Gospel accounts. We can see more in depth the race that Jesus had to run. But we know this, Jesus Christ endured great physical suffering. And we can't even imagine the limitations of God taking on human form, how He willingly limited Himself and, 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 and cut back who He was, limited his, 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 uh, his power and His ability. We can't even imagine what it was like to limit Himself into human form. 
But because we are human, we can understand a little bit of the suffering, but even, in, even then, just a taste of it. We think of the physical suffering that Jesus Christ endured. The Bible says, For the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. He endured the cross. I've said this before, and I think it's important to remember the cross as an execution method used by the Romans was not strictly used to execute criminals. There's much easier ways to do that. The purpose of the cross was not just to execute the enemies of the Roman government, it was to teach a lesson to all others that might choose to rebel against Rome. When Jesus Christ was crucified, and we can read about His crucifixion, we know that He was beaten. We know they laid a cat of nine tails across His back and lashed Him. We know that, that His beard was plucked. We know that they took a, 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 a bunch of thorns and wrapped Him as a crown around His head. And blood would have been pouring uh, from His scalp. And, and He would have been bruised and, and battered. And, and, and His back would have been bloody and, 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 and sore. And then He was nailed to that cross with the nails piercing His hands and His feet. And that cross would have been lifted up most likely and dropped into a hole. And as Jesus hung there six hours Jesus hung there six hours of dying Jesus was there on that cross and we know that as you hang there from your hands uh, you can inhale but you cannot exhale air in order to exhale he would have to push off that nail on his feet and pull up with those nails on his hands so that he could exhale and then catch another breath and hang there until he had to exhale again all the while scraping his bloody and raw back up and down on that rough crude cross for six hours Every breath was a battle. Every breath was agony. Every breath was torture. On top of all the other physical torture, when it says He endured the cross, we cannot even imagine the physical pain Jesus Christ endured for those six hours that day. And you've heard me say it before, and we cannot forget that's just the beginning of the pain. He endured the emotional suffering as well. The Bible says here, He endured the cross, despising the shame. To despise, it's to think against. He, he thought against that shame. And, and imagine the shame. And imagine the shame of those 12 disciples. And think of those 12 that Jesus spent three years with and, and He's eaten with them and, 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 and traveled with them and, 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 and they've seen Him do miracles and He's spent time with them, praying with them and instructing them. And, and now at the end of His life, one of them betrays Him. Can you imagine the shame? When Jesus Christ is arrested, the other 11, they all, the Bible says they forsook Him and fled away. Imagine the shame. Peter, who did follow afar off, when he's there outside of, of the high priest's home as, as Jesus is being tried and, and, and lied about, he's outside and Peter denies Jesus three times. Imagine the shame. And then he's made fun of. Is after the false accusations and the lies, and, and he's made fun of and insulted by the Roman guards, and, and he's stripped naked, and he hangs there naked on that cross. Imagine the shame. Emotionally. Physically, it would break us. Emotionally, I cannot imagine. I can't imagine. We haven't even gotten to the worst part. The worst part is what I did to him. I didn't put nails in his hands. Not physically. I didn't forsake him and flee in that garden that day. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is the spiritual suffering. The reason he had to go to that cross was because I'm a sinner. 
those thoughts that I thought, those things that I said, those deeds that I did, that's the reason Jesus Christ went to the cross. Somebody had to pay for my sins and, and, and if I was to try to pay for it myself, I would spend an eternity in hell separated from God. The God who created us, Jesus who is the author of our creation, wants to have a relationship with us. And so Jesus was willing to go to the cross to restore what was broken, to, to fix those things that I tore up and, and, and to allow me to have a relationship with God again by paying the price for my sin. Because when Jesus Christ hung there, He did not just suffer neglect or or, 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 or was just rejected or, or just suffered physically. The Bible tells us He took our sins upon Himself. I read before, before you how the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was blotted out and it was nailed to His cross. Those nails that went into His hands and feet went into the ordinances of sin and the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was born in Jesus' body. He endured the spiritual suffering. The Bible says there in verse number 3 in our text, Hebrews 12, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. The contradiction here that Jesus Christ who is perfect and holy and God come down in the flesh. The contradiction is, is that He bore the sins of the wicked, of sinners like you and me. He suffered there like He was the guilty one. He suffered in, in, in ways we cannot imagine in order to pay for our guilt. Consider that contradiction. Consider that Jesus Christ endures that contradiction. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Don't give up. Because Jesus Christ, our example of running the race, Jesus Christ, who looked past all of that to the joy that was set before Him, Jesus Christ, who looked beyond, who looked beyond the pain and the suffering and the cost to the joy that was set before Him, that He could sit down at the right hand of the throne of God, that one day He could call us, His children, home, those that He paid for, those that He endured for, He can call us home. Look beyond the suffering. Look beyond the pain of this life. Look beyond the problems that we are facing and look to the joy. That's the example Jesus has given us. Your life is a race. And I know we're going to endure difficulty and pain and suffering and, and shame and, 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 and sin. But can I encourage you to look to the joy that is set before you? Because we can overcome the problems of this life. We can overcome the difficulties. We can be victorious in this life. I, I've shared this with you before, and, and I, I think it's a great illustration, certainly given the, the context here today. In 1954, a fellow by the name of Roger Bannister did the impossible. Roger Bannister ran the mile in 3 minutes, 57.9 seconds. You see, it had been accepted, and it was just accepted. Man could not run a mile in less than 4 minutes. Nobody had ever done it. It was physically impossible for a human being to do it until Roger Bannister did it. And what's so unique about this, what is so special about this, is not just that one person had the ability to do it, because since then it's been broken many, many times. Any Olympic runner is going to run a sub-four-minute mile. But what's unique, this is not just some... Roger Bannister was not some freak of nature. He was not uniquely, physically equipped to run above all other runners. Because listen to this. On May 6, 1954, he ran that mile in less than four minutes. 46 days later, John Landy broke his record. In the three and a half years later, it was broken by 16 different runners. 
The problem was not human ability to overcome that, that, that marker and overcome that obstacle and to run that race. It was not human limitation physically. It was human limitation mentally. And once Roger Bannister proved it could be done, 16 different guys did it over the next couple of years. And today we look at our lives and we say, listen, I, I, the, the health problems and the financial problems and the spiritual struggles and the, and, 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 and the things that I don't like in this life, how am I going to come through and, and make it through these things? Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ, the race He has run, and consider Jesus Christ, who ran the race, who looked ahead to the joy that was set before Him, was able to endure the cross and despise the shame, and now He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to Jesus Christ. What has He done for you? Don't be wearied and faint in your mind. Look to Jesus Christ, who endured such a contradiction of sinners against Himself, and you say, life isn't fair, and I don't want to have to deal with this. Consider Jesus, who endured this of sinners against himself and don't be weary or faint in your mind you can run the race you can win the race looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith we've used these verses in the end of every one of our sermons here on this topic I'll once again turn there in 1 Corinthians 9 24 and 25 the Bible says know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we and incorruptible. Can I tell you something, Christian? Run the race. Stay faithful. Be in God's Word. Stay faithful in God's church. Stay faithful in loving and serving others. Be faithful in being a witness. You can run the race. There is an incorruptible crown at the end of the race. Don't give up. Don't quit. 